So hi, I'm Steve Hassan, and it's my honor to have uh, with us today Dr. Robert J. Lifton, one of my mentors, a man whose book helped rescue me from the Moonies back 44 years ago in 1976. Look, I wanted to plug this book about cults, destroying the world to save it, and your most recent book, Losing Reality. And let's see, on cults, cultism, and the mindset of political and re religious zealotry. So I wanted to get that out of the way. And we may hold them up again towards the end. But Dr. Lifton, so much has happened since the last time we've talked. And I guess I want to just give you a platform to share your, your thoughts, your wisdom uh, about what's happening in our country, in the world. Uh, well, I'm delighted to be talking with you, Steve, uh, and my wisdom at this point may be partial because there are so many things that we don't know, but there's much to be said for thinking about them and applying one's knowledge that one does have to them and trying to get into them in a new way because we are facing uh, vast new situations now. Yeah, exactly. So where shall we start? We, I, I'm, I'm personally so pleased that Joe Biden has won, that the Electoral College has weighed in, that we have a, a, a competent incoming administration in January 20th, but it can't come fast enough. And uh, most recently, Mitch McConnell has admitted that Joe Biden was the lawful winner of the election. And uh, Bill Barr has said there's no widespread fraud. Now, with all of that, there's still 70 million Americans who apparently still believe that Trump won the election. Well, the, um, the insistent manner in which Trump himself has denied the truth of the election. I shouldn't say denied, I should say rejected. Uh, the truth of the election is an indication of the, call it the reality disorder of the whole society that we're in the middle of. Uh, first, about the election. Well, the election, uh, what we call denial, but I call rejection, is the ultimate expression of Trumpism uh, in its violation of truth. And the reason why I favor the word rejection rather than denial is that I believe there's lots of evidence that in some part of his mind, Trump knows well that he lost the election and lost it handily. Uh, in another part of his mind, he believes he won it. Uh, and one can have these two contradictory, absolutely uh, antagonistic views of any matter, uh, such as the nature of the human mind. And the other thing I'd say uh, to help start us off is that this whole issue of reality now is the most important one for us as psychological professionals to address at this time, at this time of transition. And one way to begin that address is to recognize that, and, and you know this well from your study of cults, recognize that belief is not some absolute that stays in the mind in a single form forever. Belief is a form of adaptation. Uh, followers in cults can embrace the entire constellation of a guru's falsehood because it serves them in their adaptation at that point in their lives. Uh, and adaptation is after all, the great human evolutionary achievement. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why we become uh, such masters of the universe, uh, though uh, at this time in grave danger of doing ourselves in. So 
this issue of reality and truth and the means by which we adapt to it is what really confronts us as we see a transition in uh, administrations. And then there's a lot that we can say on both sides of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what, what, I, what I would like to um, add since I've spoken with you last was I've been involved with deeply researching QAnon and what I didn't understand but I now do is that the whole thing was a psychological warfare operation and that it was based on alternate reality gaming uh, structure to make people try to solve the puzzles of what the Q drops were, only it entered the real world. It wasn't just a video game anymore. It became confused with the real world that I've discovered there's hypnotic stuff that's being intentionally used to indoctrinate people into this black and white all or nothing belief system that um, and that we're so um, vulnerable. You know, when I was recruited into the Moonies, we had to ask people about their backgrounds to figure out how to find what buttons to push to get them involved. Now with all the data mining that's happening on the internet with from, from uh, Cambridge Analytica, from, uh, from, you know, there was a documentary, The Great Hack about that. There was another documentary called Social Dilemma about how Facebook and Instagram and all of the platforms are being generated through AI to uh, tune uh, interests and to then radicalize people because false news spreads more easily. And so where we used to think people had to be isolated to some compound somewhere. Now people have phones and they're psychologically being isolated. Of course, the pandemic has made everything even worse in the sense that people are more susceptible. But what I've learned is we're now needing, go back to your original point, we're adapting to a digital reality that is easy to manipulate, including fake news and, and uh, uh, you know, fake videos, deep fakes, et cetera. The digital reality, uh, as we all know, is absolutely crucial and central to so much that's happening. But um, when we look at QAnon, and I don't know as much about it as you've now discovered, um, still and other forms of um, falsehood and manipulated uh, reality, I don't think we should assume that that's our only future. Uh, and uh, even the term post-truth, I find a little offensive. Uh, Me too. I, know, I know it's a catchy image uh, about uh, the loss of clear truth and it's often used with uh, some pain and often resignation, but post anything is misleading. Uh, you know, uh, what is post enlightenment or post modern? Something after the enlightenment, something after the modern era. Um, uh, this is after the truth era. That's a little too glib. It's rather a struggle over holding to a concept of truth and reality uh, and holding to criteria of evidence on the one hand and the absence of that and the embrace alternatively of either falsehood because one believes in an alternate reality as it's been called or um, lying, which is so-called disinformation and um, the awareness in the same mind 
that what one is manipulating is false and that awareness makes that manipulation lying. And as you heard me emphasize before, I'll just mention it briefly here, um, there is such a thing as factual and immediate reality. Of course, there are large theoretical realities that are uh, an expression of influence of leading figures or leading ears, and one can vary about that. But there are truths about uh, particular events, what Eric Erickson liked to call actuality, meaning they occurred, they took place, uh, they are immediate. And there, the coronavirus uh, has had some interesting influence because it's so physical, so physiological in its um, incidence of contagion and illness and death, and so uh, remorseless in this physical way, it's very difficult to negate, to reject that reality. Uh, and that's true of the virus. Uh, uh, and it's also true of uh, the um, amazing progress that's been made on con combating the virus in equally physiological ways by vaccines. Mm -hmm. all, all this is now, uh, and this makes doctors and in another, in a related sense, psychologists even more central in this struggle to sustain actuality and truth. Uh, the, we're seeing that now uh, with both the virus and the vaccine, but the reality falsifiers even try to continue a falsification about them, either to deny periodically and strongly the significance of the coronavirus, uh, or to refuse uh, and deny the significance of the vaccine. Uh, and this is a terrain, a life and death terrain, that we can have some influence when we further explore and try to get underneath this aberrant self-destructive behavior. And the other thing I've thought of, uh, and we've got to think of it as long as for the next month in which um, Trump is still president, this is an era of presidential killing. Uh, Trump and Trumpists have been responsible for tens or even hundreds of thousands of deaths by their own collusion with the coronavirus. And one can apply that analysis to climate change as well, where they contribute to the potential end of our civilization by not only rejecting, but defying uh, necessary steps to take in connection with climate. Uh, in this and many other ways, we are ridding ourselves of a criminal administration. And it's not for us, the psychological professionals, to take the steps to remove him. He is on his end game. It's for us, I think, our task to make known as well as we can how these reality distortions can be deadly uh, and criminal. Uh, and I've also, uh, I can't recall whether you and I have discussed this, but I've written a bit and have thought a bit about parallels between Trump still and Nazi behavior uh, in the reversal of healing and killing mm -hmm. and being responsible for so many uh, coronavirus deaths uh, in the name of healing society, opening it up without any consideration of the deep uh, dangers of the pandemic that might be uh, spread as indeed they have been. 
uh, that is parallel to the Nazi reversal of healing and killing. That is not to say that Trump is a Nazi. It's to say that he and his followers have, the, have done things parallel uh, to what the Nazi and very reminiscent to what the Nazis have done. And from the standpoint of that analysis, uh, Scott Atlas, who had until recently been in charge of decisions about the coronavirus and handling of it, uh, is reminiscent of a Nazi doctor mm -hmm. seeking to do what the Fuhrer wants. Uh, and what the Fuhrer has wanted in this occasion has been to allow for maximum killing through ignoring the effects, through not taking necessary steps to mitigate the virus, but going further and entering into doing steps that intensify, nurture, further the deadly impact of the virus. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not a that's a terrible place for a society to be. It's a harsh analysis, but I think an accurate one. Uh, and now we have to deal with Trump's end game, as we can call it, and with uh, the society after Trump has left the White House. Exactly. So I want to agree with you 100%. It's been so annoying to me to hear media pundits talk about we're living in a post-truth world because truth is science that is testable. And if we find a better explanation or hypothesis with evidence, then we change the hypothesis. But the idea that there's no such thing as a, a objective reality, like gravity doesn't exist or electricity because you can't see it doesn't exist is an absurdist position. And then I want to say that I, I think of it and I, I talk about it as if we live in the age of influence. As a and, and we live in the age of influence, not a post-truth world, but a, an age of influence where people are confused between ethical influence and unethical influence. And, and, and looking at sources of information, whether there's credibility, if there's evidence versus very emotional, fear-oriented uh, messaging, but there's no substance. Yes. Um... And of course, the enormously important and equally difficult question becomes, how do we diminish, how do we, uh, how do we support and sustain actuality and truth and diminish uh, falsehood and lying about very central events in our society? Right. And I want to, I also want to, you know, uh, do a shout out for you. You did the forward to a book called The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump that was edited by forensic psychiatrist Bandy Lee, along with some 36 other uh, mental health professionals and other experts. But largely, she's been censored from the mainstream messaging platforms that media provides, as have I for that matter. And um, I think that the media bears some, some responsibility also at who, who they're choosing to message. And the media has always had a certain suspicious uh, feeling towards psychological uh, analyses. And yet I think much of that message has gotten across despite that mm -hmm. because you hear media people talking about uh trump being unhinged and they certainly recognize his violation of reality they point it out uh and they will often mention that same book uh that i originally wrote an introduction for and that Bandy Lee edited 
uh, and other work that she and others and I too have done. Uh, and the idea of Trump being a man who creates his own reality, what I call solipsistic reality, that idea is widespread and increasingly widespread. They may not call it solipsistic reality, but they'll call it falsehood, and then they'll uh, explain why it is falsehood. So I think that even though there have been barriers and there has been uh, uh, a really uh, bizarre position on the part of the American Psychiatric Association about psychiatrists speaking out, which nobody with any gumption uh, would follow. Uh, despite that, I think much of the word has, uh, has got, gone about. And the psychoanalytic groups uh, and psychological groups in general have had a lot to do with that. I've spoken, it just happens in recent days, well, uh, in the last few months to three different psychoanalytic groups or three different occasions they're extremely open to this and they hear about it from their patients and they uh, with increasing energy assert some of these issues uh, and every major uh, psychological organization with the possible exception of the American Psychiatric Association, my own, uh, has given up on trying to silence members on this issue. And even the American Psychiatric Association doesn't have much to say uh, about uh, uh, this kind of point. So in general, in terms of perhaps being excluded from mainstream thought, the ideas of psychological disturbance and dangerousness, uh, which we psychological professionals have uh, made so we've gotten around. I wouldn't despair about that. And I think they've contributed to, uh, in, in a way, uh, contributed to uh, this being the end game of Trump and to Trump's loss uh, in the election, uh, which, as you know, did not go as well as progressive and anti-Trumpist people wanted it to go in general, but certainly removed Trump from office uh, mm -hmm. with a, a considerable majority. Right. So I want to push you a little bit, if I may. Um, if, if Joe Biden's uh, team said, what do we do about healing the polarization in America right now? Uh, any thoughts or recommendations? I know I have a bunch, but I'm very interested to hear what you, what you think about um, what could be done. I'll, I'll, mention, um, I'll mention a couple without claiming to know exactly what is best, but um, there is a sense, and this is maybe a moment of psychological modesty, there is a sense in which many psychological problems, or how shall I say, problems that we see psychologically and as very dangerous can be mitigated by wise political behavior. You don't you, it's pretty hard to analyze a whole society, but you can provide political uh, projects that benefit it and benefit the adaptation that we all make. And that means, um, for instance, focusing on uh, policies that benefit working people uh, and people who have felt alienated. I don't think there's much choice, uh, there's much to be gained, and I don't think you would uh, believe it to be true either, by going and trying to uh, use direct persuasion on people who are bound uh, to Trump uh, as his so-called base. Um, but if you continue to offer them and the society as a whole decent health care at an important, at a, a 
you know, a reasonable cost uh, and jobs and infrastructure repair in ways that they can see their lives to be improved, there would be a whole in-between population that would, who have been for Trump that would switch over and have switched over to either Biden or at least non-Trumpist behavior. Um, <clears throat> and I think also um, there is accompanying this, a process of truth telling. I think Biden and his administration are aware of this, but to be a continuous truth teller is very tough for a political leader. Mm. Uh, there aren't too many, uh, and uh, some may be more than others. But uh, that I think uh, is, is crucial. And in that sense, you know, I revert to some thinkers whom I uh, admire. Uh, one is Václav Havel, who spoke of living in truth. And that means living in truth as individuals and within our professions and as leaders in our society. Uh, really, it's not too much to say that this society has been living in falsehood to a considerable extent, at least falsehood coming from the top. Mm -hmm. It's a steady reign of falsehood and conspiracism, mm -hmm. uh, which is a version of falsehood. Uh, and <clears throat> that can't be readily reversed, mm -hmm. but there can be policies and attitudes at all levels. And I think uh, there has to be a lot more investigation of the psychological and political levels uh, at which this can be true. And then the other thing I would say, there's much discussion and controversy about how much of what we've been going through has to be confronted. There's something, uh, there's something in uh, Joe Biden that would like to leave it behind and just move ahead. And one can understand his feeling that. But I think he does that at his peril, because I think that uh, it's not exactly following the model of the individual who must face his or her earlier conflicts in order to emerge <clears throat> relatively free of them. Uh, but there is something to be said for society at least partially confronting what kind of disorder it's been uh, involved in and how that disorder came about. And uh, there's much to be said for that. And I think certain people are speaking out for confronting what we've been part of uh, <clears throat> and even the attempted coup d'etat uh, based on falsehood, which Trump and uh, Trumpists uh, have been really attempting to bring about. So I stand for those who will confront it, even though Biden has to also transcend it. Mm -hmm. That's the word I would use. You can't ignore it. You must confront it, but you can't be stuck in it either. Right. In that sense, you must transcend it. You can't simply uh, resign yourself to a post-truth society. Nobody wants to do that. One has to recognize the assault on truth and then transcend it uh, with truth uh, in a nitty gritty systematic way at all levels of society. And truth that includes revealing what the illness, the social illness has been. Uh huh. So um, to ask you a tricky question then uh, based on that, do you think, because there's, I'm hearing many different points of view on this, do you think that Biden should um, pursue criminal uh, prosecution or leave it to the state of New York to pursue criminal prosecution of Donald Trump? I think criminal prosecution should be pursued, whether it's federal or state, and certainly state might have the best opportunity uh, given Trump's array of pardons that we expect, including possibly pardoning himself. 
Uh, but having said that, I don't think that Biden should be the leading voice in um, pursuing that kind of investigation and prosecution. I think it should be an independent judiciary, a really independent. Yeah. Uh, and that becomes crucial because it's always tempting. Trump is not the only one. He's just the most egregious uh, president in his um, uh, embrace and uh, control of the justice system uh, of the um, Justice uh, Department uh, with, of course, uh, Bill Barr's collusion with him until recently. <clears throat> so that must be avoided and any semblance of it must be avoided by Biden. And in that sense, I believe his choice of attorney general is very important and he must really give that attorney general freedom, but that should include freedom to prosecute any who have broken the law, and that certainly would include Trump. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you said that, because that's been my opinion, um, actually, uh, that we can't ignore all of the violations of, 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 of law. But I, I also want to comment on your, your um, statement that we're not going to get out of the mess, the polarization mess through persuasion. And I agree with that um, to an extent. I do think we need to do education. I do think that the, one of the biggest things that I've been saying from, since he was elected is that the worst thing that family and friends can do with someone who's gotten under the spell of Trumpism is to call them names, say they're stupid, you know, uh, depersonalize them and cut off from them. I'm encouraging people to reach out to their family and friends to reestablish bonds, maybe even avoid political discussion, but to begin to start connecting again on a human level. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, I think uh, where it's possible to connect on a human basis, uh, where there's some kind of respect and some willingness uh, I think in a way, uh, since, as you know, Trump has been a combination of a cultic guru and a mob boss, uh, <laughs> that's not a happy combination. And um, those who have given themselves totally to this Trumpist combination uh, will be aggressive and difficult to uh, approach. And uh, at their worst, and of course, they are violent and, <clears throat> and they <clears throat> can be white supremacists uh, and other forms of um, uh, totalistic uh, uh, organization and behavior. And, and that violence in them can be dangerous because it's been so encouraged by Trump. But there is a significant uh, number of people, there are a significant number of people who voted for Trump and who are now uh, less certain about him. Right. A little more open to uh, discussion. And yes, of course, any opportunity. I'm not sure that one has to seek them out, uh, but I do think one has to make available to them human interactions and truths that are general and not themselves attacking. And then there is the unknown area that you and I have discussed before of those disciples of Trump who begin to turn on him or will turn on him. We haven't seen much of that. Uh, certainly his hardcore base stays with him, but um, insofar as that hardcore base can be isolated uh, by uh, the kind of behavior we've been discussing. Uh, it has, it moves more to the fringes where it has been before. And um, when there is still the unknown way in which Trump's end game as president will play itself out, if he is humiliated, 
and he may well be, a certain amount of humiliation is already taking shape as people like Barr and McConnell, uh, his most uh, loyal enablers and, um, uh, how shall I say, co-criminals really, mm -hmm. in, in what they have done in threatening democracy, when they say the game is over, he becomes certainly more uh, isolated and the humiliation begins to set in. With public humiliation, there is still some possibility that uh, it will go the Om Shinrikyo way in which very loyal intense disciples, as you know, were among the first to turn on Asahara, the guru of Om Shinrikyo, uh, once he was de-guruized, de-guruized, uh, uh, and um, became a prisoner uh, and uh, was revealed to have committed crimes that others could recognize, uh, they were bitter and called him uh, a terrible human being and a false guru and worse, uh, an I... evil person. Now, you can't depend on this kind of reaction from Trump's most ardent followers, but you can expect a few, and it, just a few would go a long way, uh, of former followers to turn on him with a certain kind of bitterness characteristic of those who had particularly believed and given believed in and given their lives to a guru yep. and now find that to be under false claims. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so Joe Walsh was a big supporter who's been very vociferous against Trump. There are a number of of, of Trumpists who have been very vocal uh, and are speaking out, and now speaking out about saving democracy itself, not just um, Trump, but just we need to re reinvigorate democratic institutions and put in checks and balances to make sure nothing like this can ever happen again to our society. Institutions are crucial, and uh, the institutions. Were, have been battered and still are being battered by Trump. Just look at the intelligence institutions where he's installed a few political hacks who have nothing to do with uh, the nature of those uh, agencies and uh, his attempt to control even the post office. Uh, all these are egregious and the institutions uh, in being attacked have bent have sometimes served Trump, but haven't been totally broken. Right. Uh, and that's the advantage of having had democratic institutions, which in the past have had to be open to various truths in the whole messy performance that democracy always is, uh, but still had that openness. And that's where our own work on totalism and cultism uh, has enormous significance uh, because the institutions have to be, and at their best have been the opposite of cultism. Mm -hmm. They've been open to, they've been, uh, they've been uh, populated by professionals who are honorable and yes. we've seen some uh, even among loyal, even among Republicans or people who had been Republicans until very recently. Uh, and uh, it can't be an individual matter. It's got to be institutional. And here we have to recognize that even the Trump phenomenon is partly and importantly him. He's sui generis. He has unique capacity for a solipsistic reality and conducting it effectively and also for attacking and uh, having attack dog uh, paranoid approaches toward enemies. But there's also a large segment of society, uh, as we know, which has been paranoid in style as Hofstede told us a long time ago, uh, 
a group uh, that has been nativist, uh, suspicious of government and governance, and uh, claiming a version of individualism and individual freedom that may uh, take precedence or that should in their eyes take precedence over the life and death requirements of, um, of um, the virus and sickness and health. Right. Public health in the truest sense. Right. So I guess I want to, because we're going to wrap up shortly, but I want to come back to uh, denial of global climate crisis and make a connection between the disinformation campaigns done to protect the tobacco industry saying, no, there's no evidence of cancer, even though they knew for decades because they wanted to protect their money and fossil fuel countries and entities that are paying people to uh, millions of dollars to put out this information that uh, climate change is a hoax. And this is connected to what we're facing right now in, in, is the challenge of science itself, the challenge of experts itself. Yes. Um, the coronavirus, which of course relates to nature, uh, nature and uh, interaction among species, uh, and, and human being, other species and human beings. Here we see the um, homicidal nature of Trumpist uh, falsehoods and uh, in, in the willingness to sacrifice, sacrifice large numbers of people. And as I said before, there is an, a strange collusion with the virus. They do everything to spread the virus almost systematically. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a parallel, well, that's obvious once you look at it. With climate it's obvious, but more pervasive. Climate includes absolutely everything. As I say, we're born into uh, climate uh, untruths. And there's the ridiculous, there's the great absurdity that if we simply did went on doing what we've been doing, which is making use of fossil fuels primarily for our energy needs uh, and do nothing else. We would do ourselves in as a species uh, pretty much by the end of the century. Uh, do nothing else. We don't need weapons. We don't need a nuclear war. Climate change is the most inclusive and all pervasive of our threats. And it seems quite clear that Trump is not only uh, calling climate, uh, climate change uh, a hoax and not only preventing uh, what we so desperately need, the conversion into renewable energy sources, right. uh, despite their economic uh, appeal, uh, he is colluding with climate threat even as he has been, he and Trumpists have been colluding with the virus. That is by trying to uh, uh, help large uh, fossil fuel companies make use of their so-called stranded assets, dig them up from the ground, even though doing so might uh, do in our civilization. Right. It's more than, uh, uh, dangerous behavior, it's collusion with the greatest of all threats that uh, confronts us. Right. And I do think, and we're going to wrap up in a minute, but I do believe there's a overlap with some of the Christian uh, uh, apocalyptic uh, leaders who think somehow God's going to magically rework the world so we don't need to worry about pollution and 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 what we're doing to the planet and for me that belief system is so scary yes absolutely i agree with you and um there are groups that 
uh, religious groups, the so-called religious groups that quote the climate uh, examples in the Bible, which include the flood and uh, include fire, flood and fire are very prominent in the Bible and absolutely uh, crucial and apocalyptic ways. And they quote these as inevitable and therefore as what we call climate change or the great fires in the West, which are a terrible climate event. Uh, they call these biblical and inevitable and an expression of God's wrath or our failure, as you know, to follow our savior, who happens to be somebody named Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are apocalyptic embraces of uh, climate destruction, climate change destruction. And there also can be the illusion by whether uh, people are religious or not, that somehow climate change will affect others. Maybe uh, people of color in the southern part of the world where it does occur earlier and more thoroughly. Uh, but the truth is that none of us on this earth is free of the effects of climate change. And one has to work one's through, way through the apocalyptic visions that falsely include some sort of, uh, some sort of visionary uh, purification mm -hmm. brought about by this end of the world that we're threatening to create. Yeah, the, the magical thinking and such. So the latest book is Losing Reality on Cults, Cultism, and the Mindset of Political and Religious Zealotry by Robert J. Lifton. Uh, Dr. Lifton, you're an inspiration. Oh, and I just got my doctorate and I'm using your, your model as others and connecting it with trafficking and trying to provide the legal systems a framework, a quantitative framework to be able to evaluate uh, undue influence or brainwashing or mind control or your term thought reform. And I gotta show the original hardback, 1961. There you were, 1961. I, we met in 1976. I don't know but, who the fellow youth is on the back of the book. But, but just for those who haven't heard us before, it was your words when we first met he, he, your words to me where you said, Steve, I just studied this secondhand, but you've lived it. They did it to you and you did it to other people. And what you're describing is more sophisticated than what the Chinese were doing in the 50s. So you need to study psychology and explain it to people like me. And here I am 44 years later and four books later. So thank you. When I said that to you, I did the world a favor. <laughs> you you did what's called therapeutic reframing because I was so depressed, so ashamed, so embarrassed, college dropout, and this Yale psychiatrist, this eminent man was saying I had something of value. Yeah, well, you did. So it touched me. Absolutely. So thank you very much. Stay healthy. Live long. We'll talk again. Uh, Steve, take next care. year. Thank you.